I had a friend um, I used to work with a long time ago, and he was always talking about this book. The book is called A Book of Abstract Algebra by Charles C. Penter, and he was always saying, oh, this was his favorite book. I was, was teaching a, a class, it was like an abstract algebra class, independent study type class with just a few students, and I was using the Saracino book because I think that's a really good book for beginners, and it's currently my favorite book for beginners. But he thought the Pinter book was better. I decided to buy the Pinter book and check it out. And I think it is an excellent book. So in this video, I want to show you the Pinter book. And my copy is super cool. It's got like, I think it's a compass. If, it's a, if, you, th if you know what it is, let me know. Leave a comment. And then it says here, examination copy. And I, I like how it's like stamped, not for sale. It feels like it's like an illegal math book. Right? I mean, look at that. But I guess it's not really illegal. I'm not, not breaking any laws or anything. Um, I have, now they call them instructor copies, I, I believe, right? So they have like the instructor versions. I have several of those. Book of Abstract Algebra. I, I think there's a Dover reprint. I'm not sure. I'm not positive. I will look for it and I will leave a link in the description if I can find the book. I'm pretty sure this book is very affordable. It is not expensive, which is really good. So that makes it a good, way cheaper than the Saracino book, I'm sure. Yeah. Copyright 1982 by McGraw Hill. I think the dedication is really cool. I, I like it because look, look at what it says. It says, to my colleagues in Brazil, especially. Newton da Costa, Aida Urrada, and Elias Alves, as well as others to as to others, an appreciation of their loyal and valued friendship. How interesting, right? Because I think I don't know where Charles Pinter taught, so maybe he traveled to Brazil and he had friends there. I just think that's kind of cool, right? Kind of neat. Brazil is supposed to be a very very beautiful place. Chapter one: Why abstract algebra? So let me just try to zoom the camera in. My lighting here isn't perfect. There we go. It's my new recording setup. I really enjoy it because I can use both hands and it's just more fun for me. And operations. The definition of groups. Elementary properties of groups and subgroups. Now I want to do some group theory. Just even like just looking at the book makes me want to like sit down and like, you know, churn out some proofs, you know, do a little bit of math, maybe, maybe a couple warm up proofs and then jump into something a little bit harder. Functions, injective, surjective, bijective function, composite and inverse of functions. Okay, per groups of permutations. Permutations of a finite set. Isomorphism, order of group elements, cyclic groups, partitions and equivalent relations, and then counting cosets, and then homomorphisms. We have quotient groups. The fundamental homomorphism theorem. Rings, definitions, and elementary properties. Ideals and homomorphisms, quotient rings. Integral domains. When I was an undergraduate, I really loved this. This was like my favorite section in the course was uh, integral domains when I was studying abstract algebra. I thought rings are so cool. I thought they were so cool. I even uh, I did some extra work on, on Ethereum rings as an undergrad. I did like a little bit of like undergraduate extra work with another professor. And um, it's, it's really quite interesting stuff. Yeah. The integers factoring into primes. I would venture to say that out of all the areas of math, I don't know. I don't want to say it's my favorite area, but it's really quite interesting. Rings of polynomials, factoring polynomials, and then, yeah, more stuff here. So we should get into fields here. Galois theory, here we go. Yeah. So it has way more content than the Saracino book, which I always recommend because I, I love the Saracino book. I've read the entire book. So I have like, you know, almost feel like I have a connection with the book. When you when you read an entire math book, you know, people always ask, do you read all your math books? When you actually get a book and you read the entire book, um, that's pretty cool, right? That's pretty cool. Most people don't do that. And not, not just read it, but like read it and like attempt like a reasonable amount of problems in each section, enough to where you feel like, okay, I can do all these. I know how to do that one, but it seems annoying, so I don't want to do it or, you know. Yeah, as long as you can do a good amount. So this book has really good explanations. It's a very standard layout. Here it defines a function uh, to be surjective. It says a function, let me zoom in here so you can see it. A function f from a to b is called surjective if each element of b is the image of at least one element of a. Okay, so he's giving an intuitive uh, definition. So basically what he's saying is if you pick an element here in b, right, if you pick an x or a y, right, 
um, you're always going to be able to find an element here that goes there. So if you pick an X, oh look, A and B both go there. Pick a Y, oh C goes there. So this function, this image here gives you the idea of what a surjective function is. This, this function here described by this diagram is surjective, okay? The domain is the set containing ABC. Uh, the codomain is the set containing XY, which also happens to be the range, which is a word that's often omitted and not used in abstract algebra. People usually call it the image of um, A under F instead of range. That was a lot of information. He calls it uh, the range. This is the same as saying that B is the range of F. So he uses range. He does not omit it. So, interesting. Bijective, it's both injective and surjective. Yeah. So basic basic function stuff there. Here it talks about groups of permutations, which is a natural um, next choice, right? Because um, permutations are basically bijections. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, here it is. By a permutation of a set A, we mean a bijective function from A to A. That is a one-to-one -one correspondence between A and itself. So it's basically a bijection. But you can think of them a little bit differently. Like it's just a different way of thinking about bijective functions. So it leads to other constructions and other ways to denote them, right? These are permutations in S3. That's a symmetric group on three elements. Sn would be the symmetric group on n elements. So here you have some permutations. So this permutation here, epsilon. Takes one to one, two to two, three to three. It's the identity permutation. Alpha takes one to one. It takes two to three. It takes three to two. What do I mean by that? I mean the first row is the, um, the inputs, the domain. Uh, the second row is the outputs, the codomain. But they're both the same set, right? So it's taking the set one, two, three into the set one, two, three. Yeah, and there's six of them. Yeah, there's six of them. You can count them using like a counting argument, and you'll see that there's three factorial, which is equal to six of them. Pretty cool stuff. Um, abstract algebra, again, is a beautiful subject. And it's just nice to look here at this book. Let's see what else we got here. Cayley's theorem, oh, that's important. Every group is isomorphic to a group of permutations, yes. That's a big deal. It's funny because you, know, you, you take an abstract algebra class and you learn Cayley's theorem, but typically you don't really apply it in like the exercises that you would have in the homework so much or in a test. Like, it doesn't come up as much some of the other theorems for example if you learn um you know how to prove something as a subgroup you spend plenty of time doing that or if you learn the first isomorphism theorem you might do a problem or two or three maybe hopefully um where you get to apply that that's always kind of fun to use in a proof so yeah so if you want to learn abstract algebra i probably should mention this right because um there might be different people watching this video so if if you don't know a lot of mathematics and you want to learn abstract algebra, my advice would be get this book. It's really good. Right? I'll, I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, I'll look for it. I'm pretty sure it's not expensive. And um, get some other books. Maybe I'll, I'll try to remember to leave others as well that I think are good and worth it. And then um, get a book on proof writing. Right? You need a book on proof writing because before you learn abstract algebra, you have to know how to write proofs. I think that um, the book by Velman is really good. Um, and so, yeah. So again, check. I'll leave all the, all my recommendations in the description as always uh, that are related to this video. So if there's anything I said, hopefully it will show up there. But yeah, awesome book. My friend used to love this book. And now I have it and I'm very happy with it. So is it better than the Saracino book? It's It's got more content. It's got a lot more content than it does. Um, it's a little bit harder. I think the Saracino book is a little bit easier. But yeah, it's a good book. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please leave a comment in the comment section below. Until next time, good luck and take care.